Hello, awesome students. It's Dr. Foltz. Today, we're going to take a look at a piece by Alice Walker called Poem at 39. Um, it was published in 1983 in Miss Magazine, and then it's republished in 1984 in a collections work called um, Horses Make a Landscape Look More Beautiful. And this is the version we're sort of taking a look at here today. So without any further ado, let's dive right into the piece itself. And let's just take a look first and foremost at the title, because that's kind of where the poem begins. It's a reflection piece on one level or another when she's 39, and more specifically, it's an elegy of sorts. In fact, when you listen to a variety of videos and some good videos on YouTube that break down the piece, as well as some um, some essays available on the internet, it really stresses how this piece is melancholy, how this piece is grieving the loss of her father, how this piece is, again, an elegy. And I don't disagree with that on any level, except for I do believe that there is something a little bit more complex that I'm interested in talking about. And that is how the first half of the piece is very different from the second half of the piece. In fact, when we take a look at this, the first half begins with how I miss my father, and then it refrains, or there's a repetition of it, over here once again. But the difference between these two lines, even though they are exactly the same, is that this line over here has an exclamation mark, whereas this line does not have an exclamation mark. On top of that, the text over here, we're going to see a lot more poetic devices in play, a lot more interesting language in play, a lot more, we'll say, imagery that's in play. I'm not saying that that doesn't exist in what I'll call this first half or the left-hand side of the poem, but what I am saying is that it certainly appears a lot less than what we're seeing in the right-hand side. So that right side or the second half of the poem, it's more celebratory of her father, whereas the first half of the poem there are moments of, I wouldn't call them regret, but definitely moments of conflict that are taking place. So let's take a look at this first stanza. So it begins, how I miss my father. What she's now going to do is she's going to list, in essence, throughout the poem, different ways in which either A, she misses her father, or B, maybe lessons that she's learned from her father, that she's remembered from her father, or ways in which her father has influenced her. So how I miss my father. I wish he had not been so tired when I was born. Now, we have this enjambment, the enjambment that's taking place in all these lines here. So we're encouraged to read it continuously as if this were one long sentence. So it would read, I wish he had not been so tired when I was born. However, we want to respect the line break right here and the line break right here and, of course, the other line breaks. And when we look at the different line breaks, we ask ourselves, why does she choose to break the line at this particular moment here? Why not break the line right here? Why not continue on and say, I wish she had not been so tired and maybe have so tired come this far? Or maybe I wish she had and then maybe broken over here, not been so tired. But she decides to break it right here and here and here. So the question is why? Well, if we're going to buy into the idea that there's conflict that's taking place, that there's regret taking place, that there may, may be some misgivings uh, in relationship to her father when she's first starting to think about him, which is writing this poem, then we read this line in and of itself, I wish he had not been. And that's very telling. Now, am I saying that Alice Walker is saying she didn't, she wishes that her father never lived or anything on that nature? No, but what I am saying here, according to this line in this line break here, there's certainly not a celebratory feeling that's taking place. Now, with that said, what is it that made her so him so tired all of the time? Well, he was tired all the time because of the profession that he had, if we wouldn't even want to call it that. He was a sharecropping farmer, unfortunately. Now, I don't say unfortunately because he was a farmer, but because of sharecropping. If you're unfamiliar with sharecropping, is, I'll leave a definition for you within the description of this video. But trust me when I say it's a perpetuation of the cycle of poverty. And unfortunately, the Walker family was a part of that. In fact, Alice Walker, if my memory is serving me correctly, she was part of nine siblings here. So you can imagine the difficulties, the financial difficulties that they were going through as it related to, well, finances because of the type of profession profession that he had. So what is she wishing? How does she miss her father? Well, it's not anything specific about her father, but really she misses the fact that her father didn't have an opportunity to spend time with her. She misses the time that he missed with her. That's what we're seeing in this first particular stanza. Notice too, that there is no imagery really taking place. There is no real 
uh, alliteration or assonance or consonants. Yes, we have Miss My over here if we want to talk about some alliteration that's taking place, but there's nothing really notable that stands out in here. Also, the words are very simple. Most of them are, sim are, are monosyllabic, and so the the language comes off across as very, sim uh, as very simple and very, I don't want to say emotionless, but I'm going to use that word emotionless right here. Let's take a look at the second stanza over here. The second stanza talks about deposit slips and checks, all right? So she says, writing deposit slips and checks, I think of him. He taught me how. This is the form he must have said. The way it is done. I learned to see bits of paper as a way to escape the life he knew and even in high school had a savings account. So we have the enjambment that takes place all the way through here. But yet each of these particular lines with the exception of this one here, we have this punctuation that tells us to stop. So let's read this without the stop here. Writing deposit slips and checks, I think of him. So this is more or less a lesson, I suppose, that she's learning from her father. This idea of the value of money. In fact, later on, she even makes it very clear that she had her own savings account. And so she learned something financial from him. But there's something that might be a little bit more interesting here that metaphorically she might be sort of hinting at. It's more than just simply she valued money or she understood the importance of a savings account. When we see here, she says, I learned to see bits of paper as a way to escape the life that he knew. And so when we think about bits of paper, yeah, sure, bits of paper could be these deposit slips and checks. But when we think about Alice Walker, she's a writer for goodness sake. So what else could be the slips of paper? Well, maybe she understood that writing and applying herself academically so that she's not working this sort of, uh, this, 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 this endless tiresome job within the sharecropping business where she wants to escape the life that he knew and this life that was so difficult that made him tired all the time so that he was not available to her. We jump down to this third stanza here. And again, let's let's think about this first this first half of the, uh, the poem here. It's really not celebratory. The language is not rich. Um, it almost doesn't read like a poem other than the fact that it looks like a poem. It doesn't really read like a poem. Um, in fact, when we look at this, not only does it not have sort of any rhyming that's taking place, when I say rhyming, I'm talking about perfect rhyme or alliteration or assonance or consonants. We don't have meter. We don't have a rhyme scheme. We don't have uh, any true form that's taking place within here. And so again, there's nothing here that implies, let's celebrate the death of my father. When I say celebrate, I don't mean I'm happy my father died, but let's celebrate his life. We look at the final stanza here for this first half of the uh, the poem or the third stanza. It says, he taught me that telling the truth did not always mean a beating, though many of my truths must have grieved him before the end. So let's stop for a second here. First of all, this stanza is about the idea of truth, right? This is disturbing here. She talks about a beating and it's almost like a backhanded compliment. The backhanded compliment of, hey, my father didn't always beat me if I told the truth. And so that's what I mean by that. And so we have this sort of conflicted view here. She's not truly saying, hey, my dad, man, he taught me how important the truth is. Certainly that's in there. But the problem that she sort of stabs at him is saying, and he beat me a lot. Now, the second part of the, I guess you could say the backhand compliment or this sort of conflict that she's feeling for her father is in the second half of the stanza, where she says that many of her truths must have grieved him by the end, right? Now, we do have a little alliteration, by the way, many, my, and must, right? And then if we really want to say, we can say this M sound at the end, and then we're getting more into consonants than alliteration, but it's the same concept that's taking place. And so not only the truth that she talked about, she learned to tell the truth, if you will, or how truths are important, but about the beating issue, that's an issue, but also she talked about her truths, her own personal truths may have grieved him. So what are those personal truths? Eh, there's a lot of possibilities. A lot of the critics that talk about maybe the truths that might have really bothered her father was the fact that she was part of the LGBTQ plus community. Specifically, she was bisexual. Uh, this was confirmed by her in a 2006 interview uh, in which she spoke about she had a relationship with Tracy Chapman in the 1990s there. And then she also talked about she had love for both men and women in that sexual way. And so possibly this is the truth that grieved her. We know too, 1982, remember uh, in 1982, she published Color Purple. 
And one of the significant, we'll say, controversies of the book at that time, which is silliness when we look at it now, but the controversy of that time had to deal with uh, relationships uh, within the LGBTQ plus community. And so this could be something that grieved him before the end. Before the end of what? This is an important line here. Before the end, of course, means his death. But no, it's a euphemism. It's not harsh. Note that it is not mean-spirited by any means. It is a softening of what she's really saying before he died. And this is an appropriate transition because when we jump over here, this becomes the much more celebratory aspect of the poem. So here we're just sort of reporting different things maybe he, she learned from him, but not necessarily in a positive way. And then when she transitions into the things where she is much more celebratory about her father, she's using a softer term here with the euphemism about before the end, as opposed to something harsh. Now, let's take a look at this. How I miss my father, exclamation mark. We can feel the pain within her. We can feel the emotion in her. And the second line begins with, he cooked like a person. Again, we have the enjambment that's taking place here. So it should really read, he cooked like a person dancing in a yoga meditation and craved the voluptuous sharing of good food. But if we look at the end here, look at the words that end. Person is being stressed here. Dancing's being stressed here. This idea of meditation being stressed here. Voluptuous sharing food. All very positive language here. All very rich language. These three words here, Dan, or uh, these two words here, meditation and voluptuous, certainly are the most robust words that we've seen so far within the poem here. Now, let's also take a look at over here. We have this introduction of some perfect rhyme, good and foo. Well, it's not perfect rhyme. We have, it's pretty close though. We have the ood sound and the ood sound. So we have the, um, the oo and then the oo, although it's a little different in terms of pronunciation. So we have the first sort of um, a glimpsing of some rhyming. We also have some nice imagery that's going on here. He looked like a person who was dancing. So we can sort of see him uh, standing there cooking, really enjoying it. How does he enjoy it? Well, it gives him lots of energy. It gives him lots of joy, like a person in yoga meditation. So either A, it's somebody who is dancing in yoga meditation. We can take that very sort of literally, if you will, meaning a person who's doing his own thing, or probably more likely, it's a person who is both filled with lots of energy, or this cooking gives him lots of energy, gives him a lot of joy in his life, but also serves as a way to calm him. The second thing here is that he wants to share lots of good food. Whether he had the ability to share lots of good food is besides the point. Remember, he's a sharecropper. And so as a, relate, as a, rela uh, as a result of that, who knows what his ability was, what his ability to do exactly uh, actually existed here. We continue on here to the second stanza. It says, now I look and cook just like him, my brain light tossing this and that into the pot, seasoning none of my life the same way twice, happy to feed whoever strays my way. So let's stop for a second here. So again, are we talking literally that she cooks the same way or is she saying that cooking is a metaphor of life? Likely it's both seasoning none of my life the same way. So she's definitely talking about cooking as a metaphor her life. Notice too has the, how the language gets much more robust again, I'm using that word again, and it becomes richer in here. So he says, now I look and I cook. And so we have this perfect rhyme, unlike it's over here, but it's pretty close over here. Just like him, my brain light, what a great image that we have here, tossing this and that. So we have alliteration that's taking place here. Notice the T's also. So we have the consonant also framing the T sound, the T sound. Notice the end of these lines here, the T sound, the T sound, the T sound, into the T sound once again, the pot, the TH sound. So we have this wonderful um, poetry that's taking place or poetic language, seasoning none of my life the same way twice, happy to feed whoever strays my way. So again, we have more rhyme that's taking place, more alliteration that's taking place, more repetition of the language that's taking place or sounds that's taking place. So we have seizing, same. So this ties in very nicely. Notice the A sound also, not just the S sound, but the A sound, so same way. So we have assonance taking place take here. We have the W sound over here twice, the W sound over here, happy to feed. Whoever strays, we have this A sound once again, and then we have the A sound once again, my way, and then way is repeated, way, way. So, and then whoever too, right? 
it's a little bit different, but it's in the same sort of category. So we have this great sound effects that's taking place. And again, we scroll over here. We don't have much of this coming coming over here. It takes place a little bit as we highlight it a little bit. Like if we jump down over to telling the truth, we can say the telling truth, the repetition of the TH, the TH over here, taught and that. So we do have it over here, but certainly not to the effect that we see here. And this is important that we see it here because she's telling you very specifically, this is something important that her father taught her. Taught her not to season her life in the same way twice. Taught her to be happy to feed whoever strays my way. What might this mean? Well, we know that she was heavily involved in advocacy. We know that, for example, that she met uh, Dr. Martin Luther King and she did do the march in 1962, I think is the date there. We know that throughout her writing career and even in her current life, she was very much a proactive when it comes to equity and equality um, and fighting for the individuals who were not given the appropriate rights as they should. So we know that she was happy to quote unquote feed or to help anyone who came or anyone who needed it in a very similar way that maybe her father wanted to be able to do, whether literally or figuratively. Let's take a look at the final stanza here, and we'll sort of close it up with this. And also we'll close up this idea that there is some sort of conflict that's also sort of percolating at the bottom that we see it definitely in the first half, but it's going to rear its head over here. He would have grown to admire the woman I've become, cooking, writing, chopping wood, staring into the fire. So let's stop for a second here. This sentence here is, or not sentence, rather, these two lines here are, they make me sad to be honest with me, with you. It says, he would have grown to admire. So it's very, very clear that at the time of his death or at the time of, here, let's use the language she used, at the time of his end, she didn't, he didn't admire her. Well, why didn't he admire her? What was the conflict that was going on? Well, it was probably the truths that we talked about. What might those truths be again? Possibly she's part of the LGBTQ plus community. There's the variety of ways that we can take a look at it, but it doesn't matter what those truths are that bothered him. The fact is, is that at the time of his passing, she believes that he did not admire her. However, she believes that eventually he would. He would grow to it just like with this poem. We begin where it's very sort of cold, how I miss my father. And then as the poem goes on, it grows, if you will, towards not just... Um, affection, but maybe admiration for him too, and showing how he positively influenced her. But it continues on. He would have grown to admire the woman I've become, cooking, writing, chopping wood, staring into the fire. So we have the cooking, of course, is mentioning over here, the cooking over here, right? The writing, where's the writing coming from? Well, it's possible the writing is over here. Chopping wood, I suppose hard work. There's nothing specific that we can sort of talk about other than the fact that staring into the fire and, you know, obviously you need wood to, 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 to make a fire, but I don't think that's what the, the, the reference here is going on at all. But what is the fire? What could the fire be? Eh, the fire is probably her father. It's probably a reference to her father. Why? Because she is reflecting specifically on whether he would have grown to admire her or not. He, she believes he would have. And so her father is still there on one level or another, certainly influencing him because she cooks just like him. Um, and hopefully he will admire and respect and continue to love her for who she is, regardless of what, regardless of her truths. So that's it with regards to this wonderful poem by Alice Walker called Poem at 39. As always, if you have any questions or comments, feel free to drop them in the discussion below, or if you like, send me a direct email. Thank you so much and have a wonderful day. Bye now.